All right, today I want to follow up on the excellent presentation made by Josiah on Kierkegaard. Wait, can you tell us what that mad imaginal means? I just thought someone might think of it. Out of our education. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Maginot Line was the defensive line that had been built by France to prevent Germany to, from invading across their borders, so instead they went up through the Belgium. It's called the Maginot Line. You ever heard that? You learned that? It's kind of a famous little piece of 20th century, Second World War history. All right. <clears throat> Uh, everything that Josiah said about uh, uh, Kierkegaard was good, and I'm, it's, he's, he's uh, saved me from having to uh, give a fair amount of information. So I'm going to hit some high points, partly reinforcing things he told you and then supplementing slightly uh, some points along the way. I do want you to know the the most important writings. There's not been a lot of philosophers where I really insisted that you know the titles of their books, but, but with Kierkegaard I want you to know these. Partly because they're such great titles. <clears throat> and partly because someday you may have a chance to read some of Kierkegaard and I'd like you to have some name recognition. <clears throat> so let me give these to you. And just the briefest <clears throat> one sentence kind of explanation of what the content of these is. Probably the one that is the most famous, the most gripping, great reading for Christians is entitled Fear and Trembling. You should read it. You should put it on your reading list, maybe a summer reading list or something like that. Some of you may, depending on where you go to college, have opportunity to read it as part of coursework, especially if you go to somewhere like Whitworth, for example, or a place like that. Fear and Trembling is Kierkegaard's treatment of the religious stage, which Josiah explained quite well. That third stage, that deepest level of experience in which you really wrestle with obeying God, not just being ethical. And a great illustration of that is the story of, what's the story that Kierkegaard uses to illustrate it's what he calls the teleological suspension of the ethical, and it is, Megan? The sacrifice of Isaac. Exactly. Abraham being asked to do a ghastly thing, to slay his own son as an act of worship. We would associate that with the most horrible forms of paganism. Abraham, I want you to take your son and perform a pagan religious ritual. Slay your son as a sacrifice to me. You know, there's nothing ethical about that. Uh, and that's what Abraham is told to do. And the question is, is he going to be ethical or is he going to be obedient? You know. Now, uh, that, that raises an interesting question. And I think it's one that Christians ought to think about. I think we ought to think about it. Because for the most part, Obeying God, at least in the culture in which you are living, obeying God looks good. You know, if you are doing what you think God is calling you to do, you tend to get positive reviews from your classmates, from your teachers, so on. And as a general rule, if I could broaden the principle a little bit, doing the ethical thing looks good and gets you a pat on the back and sort of the you know, public recognition of your virtue. And it always raises this very perplexing question, I have to say, I wonder about it with respect to myself, and it's a question you have to ask yourself sort of privately. Do I do the right thing because that's what God is calling me to do, or do I do the right thing because that's what people want me to do, and that's what they give me positive feedback for doing, you see. You see the difference? 
And so it gets very deeply into the question, why do you do the right thing? You all do the right thing, at least as far as I can tell, you're all virtuous, wonderful, you know, great Christian kids. You do the right thing. Why do you do the right thing? That's the question. Do you do it because it'll get from people like me a pat on the back saying, hey, you're a great kid. If that's why you do it, you are an idolater. You are doing it for the applause of men. And you are not a Christian. Okay? That's what Kierkegaard would say. Do you do the right thing because God calls you to do it? Well, the only test of that is what if God called you to do something that put you in a painfully lonely place where nobody gets it? What are you doing that for? What kind of idiot are you? I thought you were a Christian. What is this? You know, what if all of a sudden you are put in a place where obedience to God puts you where nobody gets it anymore and you are doing this lonely, obedient thing that strips away all the public support all the applause, all the positive feedback, and you are in this excruciating place of just obeying God because God said so. Well, that's where Abraham was. And it's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Why am I doing the right thing? Is it because of the call of God? Or is it just to get nice people around me to pat me on the back and tell me I'm a good guy, you see? And I'll tell you, he probes that question so deeply that by the time you read that book, you are wrung out. What he does is he keeps telling the story of Abraham over and over and over. He'll tell it, and then he tells it again, and then he tells it again, and every time he tells the story, he just tweaks it slightly. Yes. So the first time he tells it, maybe he just emphasizes that Abraham rose early in the morning. And that becomes the centerpiece of the whole story. Abraham rose early in the morning to take his son. Maybe the next time he tells the story, he emphasizes that Abraham put the wood on the back of his son as they went up the mountain. The next time he may emphasize some of it, he tells it over and over, each time taking one little part of the story and just highlighting it, but all of them working toward that same question, you know. And I'm telling you, I, you know, I read Fear and Trembling, I just go, I'm not I'm so sure I'm, I am. I don't know if I am a Christian. You know, by the time I read this guy and he's done his surgery on my soul, I kind of go, whoa, you know, what kind of fraud hypocrite am I? You know, compared to the, the way that he probes in there. So anyway, I, I think it's, it's great reading. Um, it, I think it's Kierkegaard is its best. And it's certainly uh, um, good food for your heart. All right. Another uh, title, another great book is Either Or. Either Or. Either Slash Or. A little more difficult. Here he's simply highlighting that the heart of a life of faith is always a life of decision. Every day, every moment, you are making a decision, you see, in that decisive as aspect of uh, Christian living is what's highlighted there. His heaviest, most dense, difficult work, the one I would not recommend to you right off the bat until you're you know, doing your Ph. studies, PhD studies in philosophy, then you might want to plow through this one, is called Philosophical Fragments. This is where Kierkegaard proves that he is a serious philosopher. He can play with the big boys, you know. He, he can play in the big leagues. Uh, he can take Hegel on on his own terms, which is basically what he does in that one, philosophical fragments. So in order to understand that one really well, you need to understand a lot of philosophy. You really do. You really have to have a pretty good handle on Hegel, Kant. This is where Kierkegaard kind of lays out his response to the great philosophical tradition that's come down. <coughs> Kierkegaard, for the most part, is writing to Christians. Um, but there, he's writing to philosophers and telling them they're a bunch of hypocrites. You brood of vipers. <laughs> you know, that's kind of, this is Kierkegaard, the, uh, the John the Baptist sort of uh, 
into the world of philosophy. So anyway, that's uh, that one. Another one, stages along life's way. This is where Kierkegaard lays out his three stages that Josiah described quite well. The aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. Sickness unto death, well worth reading. And Josiah did a great job of uh, surveying that. I won't say more about it. Hopefully you've got that in your notes, but it's where he talks about despair in his sort of unique sense of the word despair. Probably his most famous piece of devotional literature, and again, this is great stuff to read devotionally. You know, if you like to read a little bit of devotional literature in the morning as part of your morning you know, time of quiet reflection and devotional life, then this is a good thing to incorporate into it at some point. And it's called Purity of Heart. Purity of Heart. <coughs> ah. <coughs> those are the uh, uh, titles. There are certainly more, but those are the ones that I'd say are the most. important, the ones you're most likely to come across. If you think about Kierkegaard's life, I have found it helpful to think of his life, and you cannot separate his philosophy from his life. He's one of these characters where, in a sense, he lives his philosophy. Unlike people like Hegel, whose life is deadly boring, or Kant, who cares, Kierkegaard, we care. You see, his story <coughs> is uh, very much a part of the philosophy. So there's uh, four parts to this. The first part, Kierkegaard the Sun, 1813 to 1838. Secondly, Kierkegaard the Lover, From 1838 to about 1842. Kierkegaard, the polemicist. Oh, how do you spell it? It's a polemic. I think it's I. Polemics. Polemicist. What is polemics, by the way? What is that? The word. Polemic, polemics, anybody know this word? Polemics, if you were to go and engage in some polemics this afternoon, you would be doing what? I don't know, Jacob? It's kind of like, I don't know how to explain, like kind of like criticism or oratory type. Okay, it is, right. It's usually associated with debate. It'd be something like dialectics, debate. And finally, uh, Kierkegaard, the witness. By the way, this is uh, 42 to 48, the last one 48 to 55. Just a uh, couple of highlights. Josiah again covered this uh, quite well. Kierkegaard had a complicated relationship with his father. His father thought that he had committed, that is, his father thought the father had committed the unpardonable sin. And when your father believes that he's committed the unpardonable sin, it puts you in a rather strange home situation, you know. He lived with a father who thought for sure he was going to hell and that there was nothing he could do about it. And the father, however, out of love for his son, wanted to do anything he could to prevent his son from finding himself on the same path and so Kierkegaard grew up in an extremely severe kind of home in which he was disciplined closely and harshly by a father who had despaired of his own salvation, what was doing everything he could with respect to hopefully salvaging the uh, life of his son. Well, that caused Sorry Kierkegaard to develop a high degree of hostility and anger and rebellion, you know, because 
the psychology of the home was such that he didn't feel very close to his father. He just felt that his father was kind of this really, you know, un unbelievable disciplinarian. And so it was, uh, it was a very difficult home situation. Uh, and so early, early in his life, uh, kind of in his teenage years, when he was probably about your age, he was living in something like open rebellion running around and so he's doing all the stuff that his father had hoped he would never do. It's like the, the worst possible outcome, you know. Dad was trying to keep him on the straight and narrow and that very fact caused him to sort of go off uh, in a uh, loose cannon kind of life. A, a little bit like Augustine, you know, who kind of has this similar sort of early years of rebellion. Um, it does seem that in something like uh, about the year 1838, the year his father died, uh, Kierkegaard actually does have a true, deep Christian conversion. And so assuming he was born in 1813, what does that make him? He's in his early 20s, when he does seem to come to faith, and he actually reconciles with his father before his father died. And so he, uh, uh, even though he had that rather tough uh, uh, home situation, it seems to have ended well, although I think the father still died you know, believing that he was a lost man, and I have no idea what the state of his soul actually is or was. The uh, next few years are the years that he got his, uh, uh, did his graduate studies, uh, culminating in his PhD in, in 1842, but it was also the years in which he was in love with woman I've had a crush on for years. By the way, don't tell my wife that, of course. But I think it's okay to have a crush on someone who's been dead for 150 years, right? Is that okay? Oops. Here's, uh, here's Kierkegaard. <laughs> Not a bad looking guy, really. He was in love with ah, fair lady, Regina Olson. I think that's Spencer. He was in love with her, and um, she was very much in love with him. He uh, marry, or he uh, uh, met her in school. Didn't marry her, but he met her in school, and they uh, fell very much in love. Very proper relationship. This is the mid 1800s, and and so their relationship was uh, was absolutely pure. Uh, and at one point, he proposed to her, and she accepted. And so they were officially engaged at a certain point. You were going to say that? Yeah. Well, Anything else you want to add? Go ahead. Yeah. He, he was so strongly in love with her that he felt like after he had proposed to her, he couldn't marry her, and she, he turned her down yeah. after proposing to her because he felt like he was going to ruin her life. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> this, was, uh, this is probably the, uh, the greatest crisis uh, of, of Kierkegaard's life, and it was quite profound for him. He was very much in love with her, she was very much in love with him. He was quirky, he was a quirky genius, but she liked that about him, you know. But he knew himself well enough, he, he didn't trust himself, and he was afraid that if they married, he was going to be a poor husband uh, and would just make her life miserable. But instead of explaining that to her, which he felt would be a useless attempt, you know, she would, she would figure out a way to overrule that. Instead, he did something much more painful for him and for her and simply told her she didn't, or he didn't love her and he didn't want to marry her. And she was crushed. She was crushed. And he was crushed. And it was like he did this, it was, you know, he, it couldn't have been more painful if he just stabbed himself. That's what he felt like. Um, 
And so um, they broke it off. And she was devastated and remained that way for some time. She eventually married a guy, very prominent political figure who became governor of the Danish West Indies and was a very famous guy and she was his wife. And at a later time when they returned from that time uh, in the Danish West Indies, uh, Kierkegaard asked permission of her husband to see her briefly. And he just wanted, I think probably, to try to explain. And the husband said no. He would not permit her to see him. And so they never did see each other again. So that was the... Uh... So anyway, I, I want you to, to uh, appreciate that for Kierkegaard, that was extraordinarily painful and gave, gave rise to the mood of a great deal of his writing. Um, and so sometimes when you read some of his writing and you feel the mood of it, you might realize that that's part of the background of it. What year in there did he break it This is off? toward, it's uh, 42, it's right at the end of that period. All right, the third stage along the way, or the third stage of his life, not stage along the way, but uh, was uh, what I'm calling the polemicist. And this is when Kierkegaard is really engaging in public debate. Uh, he's engaging in debate, first of all, with respect to the, uh, just the philosophical currents of the day. And secondly, to some degree, with the church. His writing was controversial, and there were those who attacked his writing publicly, and so he's engaged in kind of a public dispute, writing counterpoints, you know, so on, in various journals, academic articles, that kind of thing. It lasted for several years, and at points became somewhat vicious. Part of why uh, Kierkegaard was um, controversial was because he, like Nietzsche, was critical of the Hegelian spirit of the day. He thought that what Hegel had given to 19th century England was this very superficial belief that we're all doing really well. You know, Hegel's notion of a continual progress in which things are getting better and better, and especially in 19th century Europe, we're just almost there, we've almost made it to utopia. You know, it just can't get much better than this. And there's that prevailing optimistic, humanistic feel to the time, and Kierkegaard will have none of it. And he believes it's caused people to become very superficial in their faith. So they go to church on Sunday and they hear a nice pastor say to them all how nice they are. You're very nice people and God certainly does love you and, and you're just doing great and there's nothing to worry about. And, and we are really making it. And he just felt like that was turning Christianity into something paper thin. There's no anguish. There's no struggle. There's no looking down into the soul. There's no dark night of wrestling with the angel at Peniel as Jacob did. There's nothing of the real deep significance of what faith is about. It's just this kind of light, fluffy, happy, superficial, paper thin sort of experience of sweetness and light and nothing else. And he was so hostile to that, and he blamed Hegel for it, you see. And so he's attacking Hegel, he's attacking that whole humanistic spirit of the 19th century. And that drew a lot of fire. I might say, Kierkegaard was not well known in his day. He was Danish, so he's a Danish genius. But none of his works were translated into any other language until well after his death. And so all of this debate is taking place like a tempest in a teapot. You know, you have this little debate going on in, in Denmark, but who cares about Denmark? It's like, where's that, you know, people? And so it wasn't really until many years later that it was really discovered that Kierkegaard was, uh, was a pretty powerful character in his day, but, but in his day, it was not that he was that famous at all. But anyway, this is when he's engaged in pretty serious philosophical work. Uh, and then the last stage of his life, when I'm calling the witness, is really when he starts addressing himself much more to Christians. Not so much to the philosophical world, but more to the Christian world. 
and especially the Danish church, where he calls for personal faith rather than institutional comfort. You know, and I, you are all aware of this, so I'm just I'm kind of remarking the obvious here, but there are some people that just go to church because it's a nice thing to do. You know, it's just a nice thing to do. That's not so much true these days as it was, it was once in our culture, but there are still people who go to church because that's a nice thing to do on Sunday. Or maybe they go to church on Easter because it's a nice thing to do, isn't it? And then you go out to brunch afterwards. It's just a lovely way to kind of, you know, spend the day. And there, there, there's no serious attention to matters of faith, obedience to Christ, or what is God calling me to do, or have I repented? I mean, please. Oh, come on. It's just a nice thing to do. And it's like Kierkegaard was living in a culture in which everybody was going to church because it was just a nice thing to do, and hearing very nice sermons, and not getting any kind of challenge that forced them to think about faith, you know. And so that's what he's addressing. He's really trying to force these people to realize that Christianity is something other than just a nice thing to do. That's why he's so challenging. I think, I think it is good for us to read him. In fact, I'm going to have you read a little snippet of Kierkegaard. I'll give you the handout tomorrow. Um, because he does... Um, kind of get down inside the skin of a Christian and ask harder questions. And, and even for us, even for us, you know, it can, it can sort of turn into that. We're just doing these things because it's a nice thing to do. He doesn't let you get away with that. So, uh. All right. So uh, anyway, that's a little supplement to uh, Josiah's tribute. The other thing I want to talk about briefly are these three stages. Um, the aesthetic... ethical and the religious. I would say that if anybody knows anything about Kierkegaard, they're going to know this. This may be the most famous single paradigm that you'll come across with respect to Kierkegaard. And so I just want to make sure that it's uh, in your thinking. I, Josiah did a great job of summarizing this, so I'm not really doing much more than reminding you of it and reinforcing it a little bit. Think about it this way. These three stages need to be pictured in your mind something like concentric circles. These are not stages as if it were a timeline in which for a while you're eth aesthetic and then for a while you're ethical and then finally be you become religious. That's not the way Kierkegaard thinks of it. In other words, anybody who is, you know, if the outside, the largest ring here is aesthetic, anybody who is ethical is still aesthetic. You can't escape it. Anybody who is religious is still ethical, is still aesthetic. There, you can be aesthetic without being ethical. You can't be ethical without being aesthetic. These are concentric circles. Does that make sense? And so uh, wherever you are, you're going to be at least at that that most uh, broad level. His concern is that many people are only there. He distinguishes two types of aesthetic people. One you would call sort of the hedonist or the epicurean type. I'll just call it hedonism. That's the more common word. in which all you're doing is living for personal pleasure. Now, sometimes people live for personal pleasure at a very crass level. They're just, you know, doing, in a, in a, you know, just pursuing pleasure without much thought to consequences and so on. And he's aware of that. He's not too concerned about it. There's not a lot of people that are really serious about that sort of crass hedonism. But he does talk about people who are very refined, they know which wine goes with which kind of meat, you know. They've, uh, they're up on what's happening in the theater. They know sort of what the entertainment industry is doing. And, and they're, uh, they, they can listen to classical music and recognize, oh, oh, listen to that. Well, that's Beethoven's fourth, you know, uh, you know sixth movement. There isn't a sixth movement to the fourth symphony. You know, you know that's how much I know about it. But, you know, they can, they can recognize fine arts. 
they can go into a museum and say, oh, well, isn't that lovely? They recognize different art, pieces of art, and they can, you know, all of that might represent a very sophisticated level of understanding things, and yet it is still aesthetic, because you are still just a parasite. You are going around draining off of life experiences what it does for you. And even in an art museum, where you're surrounded by lovely works of art and you're a great appreciator of it, you're not contributing anything to it. You're just draining. You're just in it. You're, it's self-centered living. You know. And so that's one kind of aesthetic. The other so aesthetic person is what he calls the philosophers. What is that? Is that an alarm? And is that what Avery went out to? Uh, was it his alarm? Got it. Okay. <laughs> Under control? What? Under control? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, Kierkegaard also says that philosophers like Kant, Hegel especially, and others, who simply spin out huge, elaborate, complicated philosophical schemes, you know, all these deep kind of philosophical insights about things that don't really touch your life where you live are basically the same thing. They're just aesthetic. They're not giving you anything. They're not true philosophers. They're kind of parasitical philosophers. So he doesn't have anything good to say about Hegel, especially. He doesn't like Hegel at all. But all of these people who just sort of write in, in very complicated abstractions, Kierkegaard says you have to, life, you have to live life where you know, the rubber meets the road. This is where you have to experience the pain of life and the hardships of life. That's where philosophy happens. So first thing, aesthetic, two kinds. The hedonist, which can be either crass or refined, and the philosophers. Both of those, he says, are simply aesthetic. They've never gotten any further. Then the next stage is the ethical. Now, you never can stop being aesthetic. Every one of us lives in the world, and every one of us is to some degree surrounded by things, and we simply draw off of them the experiences of life, you know. So he's, he's not opposed to that. Kierkegaard himself was always up on the popular entertainments of the day. He knew what wine went with what foods. Yeah, he was good at that. But he just said, that's not, the, that's not what life is all about. And this deeper level is the ethical, in which a person is not so much concerned with what makes me feel good, but what makes me do good. And this is highlighted especially in either or, where he, he sets forth the decisions in life and the way in which ethical decisions need to be made. He likes Socrates, uses Socrates as kind of his great example of an ethical philosopher. He likes Socrates. In fact, he kind of viewed himself as a Socratic character, gadfly. He liked to think of himself as the gadfly of Europe. Like Socrates was the gadfly of Athens, you know. Well, you know that ethical decision making is not all that easy. Sometimes we're put in difficult circumstances. We have to choose between subtle differences. Sometimes those decisions can be somewhat excruciating. I'm thinking personally, you know, within, you all know that within the last month or so, my beloved father died. Last year we talked about euthanasia, didn't we? Remember that in ethics? I never had to deal with that up close and personal. Passive euthanasia, active euthanasia. You know, here's my dad. He's in a situation where there's no likelihood of recovery. And the questions are put to you. you know, what do you want to do? He can't decide. I'm the oldest son. All of a sudden, I'm having to make decisions. You know. And you realize that sometimes it ain't so easy. Not so easy to make those decisions. What do you withhold? What do you provide? And what are the effects going to be? 
And I have to say, I was wrestling with that. And I, I found out, you know, if I teach this stuff at the oh, I have to, I have to do it. <laughs> it's not so easy. It's one thing to talk about it in class. It's another thing to have a doctor looking at you say, so which way are we going to go? You know, kind of thing. And uh, you may very well at times in your life find yourself having to wrestle, you know, with ethical decisions, whether it's an aging parent or whether it's some other situation in life. And that's part of what life is. And and Kierkegaard would say that a person who lives his life or her life ethically is certainly living at a higher level. You're not going to escape being aesthetic, but you're living at a higher level. You're concerning yourself with weightier matters than um, uh, simply the aesthetic person would. But even there, he's saying that you're not quite at the point where the deepest and most perplexing questions of all have to be answered. And that's what he calls the religious. So this inner circle is the religious. And as I was saying earlier, uh, this is when you ask not simply, uh, you know, what is the right thing to do? But now it's why. Why? Do I do the right thing? And he believes Abraham really is the supreme example of that. And I talked about that a little bit earlier. Where you're being forced to examine whether you're willing to do what God requires of you if nobody gets it. I can't imagine being in a situation quite as excruciating as Abraham. I can't quite imagine that. You know. um, I can't imagine what circumstance might come along in your life that would put you in a comparable dilemma. I just I can't imagine. Uh, but I can imagine that all of us, including me, has to ask this question every day. You know, I ask, why do I get to teach? Why do I do it? Do I do it for a paycheck? Okay, well, if that's the reason I do it, then I'm right here. I'm an aesthetic man. I just want a paycheck. So I got a job to do. I come in here. I act like a Christian. I try to. Not very good at it. You know, try to educate you guys a little bit. Don't really care. All I care about is me. I want to get paid, go home, watch TV, have a beer, go to bed. That's my life. But, you know, you got to make money somehow, so this works for me. So, you know, well, that'd be aesthetic. All right. Maybe I... Maybe I teach because I really want to do the right thing. Maybe I think this is the right thing to do. It's a virtuous thing to do. Um, and that's okay. That's all right to try to encourage you to go in a good direction, to hopefully you know, do the right thing yourself. But uh, if I get up in the morning, I say, why do I really do this? Why do I do this? What if? put me in a position where I really was in that lonely place that Abraham was. What if that were the, what if that were my understanding of this? Would I still do it? Or would I figure out some way to avoid it? Teaching for me is a, is a quite positive experience. I get nice reviews from, I mean, reviews like encouragement from students. I get nice feedback from other teachers. I have a nice camaraderie with other faculty. Um, you know, it feels good. What if it didn't feel good? Would I still do it? If I just thought God wants me to do this and it felt miserable, would I still do it? I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. What if the only reason I were doing this was because I believed God had called me to do it? And everything else in my life was screaming at me, do something else. Do I have that kind of faith to live here? Or am I simply back here somewhere? Well, every one of you has to ask that question. I have to ask it of myself, you have to ask it of yourself. <clears throat> and it's the deep kind of questioning that you get from Kierkegaard. Thoughts? What do you think? Josiah, have I done justice to the man? Do you want to you add any footnotes? You did a great job.
presenting them, so I, have, I hope I haven't ruined your great uh, presentation. Any other? Uh, <clears throat> There's not much more I can add to what you've added to mine, but <laughs> I think you get a good job there. Uh, <laughs> no, I actually I've really enjoyed Kierkegaard, and I chose him on purpose because I knew that he he just gets the heart of the issue for me at least, just my own life. And I would definitely agree with some of these books. I haven't read, I only read parts of it. I'd like to read more, but um, yeah, he's just a solid Christian man, and he just it's unfortunate that, like you said, his works aren't published more in other languages. I know that the first. What got started really was when it got translated into German and that kind of spread from there, but he was definitely influential and could have been really influential if it been more English, yeah. but uh, he's a good leader and yeah. he's a great guy. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Great. Anything else? <clears throat> Any other feedback, thoughts? I will say this. <clears throat> Kierkegaard has gotten <clears throat> somewhat uh, mixed reviews. Um, and later, not too much later, but, but in the next two or three weeks, we're going to read some of um, Francis Schaeffer. Who's reporting on Schaeffer? You're doing Schaeffer? All right. Um, I don't know if you've dug into Schaeffer very much, uh, Stephen, but uh, you probably want to get started on that you know, pretty soon. But Schaeffer, for example, is very, very critical of Kierkegaard. And my first impressions of Kierkegaard when I was in college were through the lens of Schaeffer. And I thought, oh, Kierkegaard, man, he's a bad guy, you know. It wasn't until much later that I figured out I was kind of misjudging Kierkegaard. I like Francis Schaeffer, I like Soren Kierkegaard. But they didn't like each other very much, you know. At least uh, Schaeffer didn't like Kierkegaard, and, and there's a reason for that. And so I'll come back and try to talk about that at a later time. But just be aware that though I've given, both Josiah and I have given Kierkegaard pretty favorable reviews. Uh, there are those who would say he did a little bit of damage along the way, and we want to make sure we at least understand that. So we'll try to do justice to that as we go. All right. Arrivederci.